the Oneness Pentecostal Church. What do they believe? Well, some people classify the Oneness Pentecostals as a cult. It turns out that there are over, or at least around, 5 million Oneness Pentecostal type churches. And I'm going to say that a little bit loosely because uh, there's several different umbrellas that they could fall under. The largest of them is the United Pentecostal Church International with somewhere around 28,000 churches uh, worldwide. So it's a big movement. The Oneness Pentecostal Church, or United Pentecostal Church International, they come from the Assemblies of God movement. And around in the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, several of the assemblies, assemblies of God pastors started holding to a belief that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all the same person or being, okay? And that God just manifests himself in these three different modes, but it's the same person. This is a belief called modalism. It's the idea that in the Old Testament, God manifested himself as the Father, And then in New Testament times, God manifested himself as the Son. And we're going to talk about exactly how that works here in a little while. Uh, But God came down to earth in the form of a human and similar, somewhat similar to the biblical doctrine of the hypostatic union, where Jesus is fully God and fully man. Uh, They believe that Jesus had a human nature, and also a God nature. Then after the resurrection, Jesus or or God now exists as the Holy Spirit. Uh, In the 1900s, many of these Assemblies of God pastors started subscribing to this belief. Around 1916, uh, a meeting was pulled together to debate this issue. And many of the Assemblies of God pastors stood strong in the doctrine of the Trinity as the Bible teaches it. But about 156 of the 585 pastors uh, broke off of the Assemblies of God movement because of this sharp disagreement. Another one of the doctrines that they believe is that you must be baptized not in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as Matthew 28:19 says, but rather just in Jesus name alone. They also believe that right now, I think I already somewhat alluded to this, but that Jesus is no longer in his human body. He is manif- you know, God is manifesting right now himself as the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is not in his body form. He is not standing at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Uh, And so God is manifesting himself as the Holy Spirit. They also believe that in order to be saved, you must be baptized. Also, Oneness Pentecostals believe the doctrine of the Trinity is a pagan doctrine. They believe that if you don't manifest with the gift of tongues, you're not saved. In other words, if you don't speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit didn't come upon you. If the Holy Spirit didn't come upon you, you're not saved. Some of these oneness Pentecostals actually believe that if you're not a oneness Pentecostal, you're not saved. They also believe in foot washing uh, and that it is a divine institution that is supposed to be practiced by the church. But they also deny the Trinity. Uh, They deny justification by faith alone because they believe that baptism is a requirement for salvation. Uh, They believe that Jesus is God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, They they believe that that Jesus is the name of God. Uh, By the way, as just a side note, they also believe that Jesus did not pre-exist as the Word. They believe that being born again means that you have repented, you're speaking in tongues, and you've been baptized. 
They also believe that if you have not been baptized by oneness Pentecostal ministers, your baptism is not valid. Again, they have a special kind of baptism where they believe you must be baptized in the name of Jesus and Jesus alone, not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as Matthew twenty-eight nineteen says. And keep in mind, guys, that many of these beliefs were not believed until the Oneness Pentecostal movement came along in the early 1900s. Right, let's look at this being baptized in Christ's name alone problem. Oneness Pentecostals base this not on one scripture alone, although they usually just use one scripture to support this, this doctrine. They actually have, oh, I don't know, about eight different scriptures that they use. Okay, so when you first hear this, I think it's going to sound like a pretty good case. So let's hear them out. Let's give them a good go. All right, so Acts 2.38. Uh, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 8, verse 16, it says, For as yet he, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and then Acts 10, 48, uh, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Acts 19, 5, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And lastly, Acts 22.16, it says, now, And now why tarriest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and it says this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and by the way, this is Jesus speaking here, Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. When you look at the Bible and you look at the phrases where in the name of is being used throughout the scriptures, you actually get a little bit of a different feeling than what's being done here when we talk about baptism. You know, we, we always end our prayers by saying in the name of Jesus. Um, but when we look at in the name of that phrase in the Bible or in so-and-so's name, what we see is more of in the authority of. So baptizing in the authority of Jesus Christ, in the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's kind of like when you hear someone say stop in the name of the law. It's not that you're stopping in the name of the law. You're stopping because of the authority of the law. Now, can I back that up with the scripture? Sure, I can. Uh, let's check out Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 10. Uh, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, Doth this man stand here before you whole? Okay, so they're asking Peter, by what power or what name have you done this? And, and Peter answers and says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay, was it the name of Jesus that made this man whole? Or was it this power and authority that comes from Jesus that made the man whole? And that's the only way that that section of Acts chapter 4, 7 through 10 makes any sense. Uh, same chapter, verses 17 and 18. So Acts chapter 4, 17 and 18, we see it again. And if you look at this through the eyes of, by the authority of, when you hear in the name of, by the authority and power of, uh, it makes so much more sense. It says this, but that it spread no further among the people, 
let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, 28, 540, and chapter 9, verses 27 through 28, we see the theme of teaching or speaking in Jesus' name. Again, speaking in the authority of Jesus Christ, teaching by the authority of Jesus Christ, in that authority, in that power, they make so much more sense. Acts chapter 8, verse 12, again, this, this verse right here makes so much more sense when you look at it as in the name being in that authority and power. Acts eight twelve it says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. But I think the following verse drives it home. Acts chapter 16, verse 18. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, (laughs) turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Paul commanded this Spirit in the power and authority of Jesus Christ to come out of this woman. And that spirit came out. It makes perfect sense. So no, we don't have to be just baptized in the name of Jesus and just Jesus. I'm sorry, but the oneness Pentecostal uh, theology of modalism doesn't work. Just as a side, most oneness Pentecostals have a mistaken belief concerning what we believe about the Trinity. They believe that we believe in three gods, a polytheistic or tritheistic view of God, that it is three gods. No, no, no. We believe in three persons, one God. Yes, friends, the Bible is very clear that we are looking at three persons. They have their own will. They have their own thoughts. They have their own conversations amongst each other. Uh, guys, we're talking about three persons. And we're going to talk about what it means to be a person, too, tomorrow. So anyway, uh, do must you be baptized in Jesus' name to be saved? No. Must you be baptized by a oneness Pentecostal minister to be saved? No. Is Jesus now existing as the Holy Spirit? Or is he still Jesus in his body? He's still Jesus in his body. In like manner, this same Jesus will return. This same Jesus who said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. The same Jesus that says, reach here thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And in Colossians, we find out that in Jesus presently dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is in his body.